I thank you. Can I ask the public, leaving the public gallery, to do so quietly as about to start another debate? And the next item of business today is a member's debate on motion number 193 in the name of Murdo Fraser on the 750th anniversary of the Treaty of Perth. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Murdo Fraser to open the debate. Mr Fraser, please, seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking all members uh, from across the chamber who signed uh, my motion to allow this to be debated this afternoon. Now, over the past uh, couple of weeks, we've heard many maiden speeches from new MSPs who've taken uh, to the chamber to boast about their constituency. We've had to talk about the biggest, the most populous, the most diverse, and the most scenic. Well, today I thought I'd stake a claim for the most historic, for from the Battle of Bannockburn to the Protestant Reformation, towns and cities across mid-Scotland and Fife have witnessed some of the most important events in Scottish history. Perth was once one of Scotland's most prosperous royal boroughs, with established trade links to the continent via the River Tay. And that trade brought wealth, status and power, with Perth being the de facto capital of Scotland, thanks to the presence of the Royal Court at Schoon. The Stone of Destiny, where Scotland crowned its kings, was also housed at Schoon, further enshrining Perth as a place of real importance during the later Middle Ages. And indeed, as is famously known, James I, King of Scots, uh, was murdered uh, in Perth and is buried there today. Uh, I won't recount that whole story, Deputy Presiding Officer, but it is a salutary lesson of the fatal consequences of playing tennis. Now, tonight's, uh, today's debate is designed to commemorate and remember the Treaty of Perth, signed in 1266, some 750 years ago. And it set out, and why it's important really is that the treaty set forth the boundaries of much of what we call modern Scotland, with the exception, of course, of Orkney and Shetland, uh, which joined subsequently. And despite the significance of this document, it is relatively unknown to most Scots today. So I'm hoping that this debate can help shed light on an important moment in our history. Before the signing of the Treaty of Perth, the Hebrides were controlled by various Norse and Gallic rulers who owed their allegiance to the kings of Norway rather than to the kings of Scots. Back then, Scotland was not the nation we know today, but rather a collection of different regions, each with different allegiances, languages, and kings. This would all change with the Scottish victory at the Battle of Largs in 1263, and I'm sure Kenneth Gibson will tell us more about that when he comes to make his contribution later. Victory over the Norwegians by the Scots ensured that the Western Isles and the Isle of Man would be Scotland's to control. The story goes that while King Alexander was banqueting in Perth for the Feast of St. John, the Norwegian king, Magnus VI, travelled up the Tay to meet him, and the treaty was duly signed at Blackfriars Monastery on the 2nd of July. In return for a payment of 4,000 marks and a tribute of 100 marks annually, the Norwegians surrendered sovereignty over the Hebrides and the Isle of Man. In some ways, this was Scotland's very own Louisiana Purchase. Although Scotland was still a country in its infancy, stereotypes surviving to this day might have been born from these very incidents. Our reputation for thriftiness was clear, as not only did the Norwegians have to wait several years for us to pay the full 4,000 marks, but they eventually stopped collecting the 100 mark annual tribute after we defaulted on paying the yearly dues. Perhaps in the current financial climate, it's better to gloss over the issue of Scotland defaulting on its debts. A copy of the treaty can be seen today in Perth Museum. The earliest surviving text is recorded in the Black Book and is on loan from the National Library. This special display and exhibition will also form part of the commemorative celebrations. And I would encourage all history buffs and Fair City residents to take a inner visit to the museum to learn more about a document that was so important to Scotland's early years. Now we've established that modern Scotland was forged in Perth, I think we should hear a bit more about what we are doing to commemorate this treaty 750 years on. Perth and Kinross Council have announced a number of special events. And this is important for a number of reasons. Visit Scotland's winning year strategy has shown the success of history in attracting tourists to Scotland. And I believe that Perth can benefit from this approach. In the past, Perth has often felt left behind when it comes to cashing in on its past. Whilst its neighbour to the west in Stirling annoyed, enjoyed not only the Battle of Bannockburn reenactment celebrations, but also Armed Forces Day in 2014, Perth has been at the back of the queue 
when it comes to attracting high profile events. I was therefore delighted to learn that the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo will be performing a mini tattoo in Perth on the 21st of August to commemorate the treaty. And the 600 performers at that event will be joined by the King's Guard of Norway, whose wonderfully choreographed marching routines are not only viral hits on YouTube, but have entertained tattoo crowds around the world for many years. And in addition to the tattoo, the council is planning to host various medieval and Viking themed events around the city on the same day. As well as these public events, there will be a private event marking the treaty at St. John's Kirk, which will welcome guests from Perth's twin cities and the Honorary Consul of Norway. If I can digress just for a moment, Deputy Presiding Officer, this debate I think can serve another purpose, and that is to highlight Perth's unique history in the year it makes its bid to be UK City of Culture. The events that are established to, to mark the treaty anniversary underline just how strong Perth's bid is for the 2021 award, because Perth, I believe, is a city full of history, art and culture, and I can think of no better expression of that than the events that are planned this summer. The Treaty of Perth was hugely important to the first days of Scotland, and 750 years old, I can believe it can be equally important to Perth as a city. They can help foster closer ties between Perth and our Norwegian neighbours, and indeed our other twin cities around the world, and also illustrate the depth of history and culture present in Perth, which, as I've said, is particularly important to secure city of culture status. So I'd like to wish uh, the Council all the best in their work to deliver the programme of events and encourage people across Scotland to learn more about this document as it's so important to our history. And I can, if I can just close, Deputy Presiding Officer, because in my uh, research for this debate uh, this afternoon, I found a cutting from the Glasgow Herald, uh, as it then was, from 1966. There was a letter written uh, to the Herald on the 27th of January 1966 by John McKechnie, of the Department of Celtic at Aberdeen University, lamenting the fact that in that year, the 700th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of the Perth, nothing was being planned to celebrate that particular anniversary. So I hope Mr. McKechnie, should he still be with us, will be uh, joining with us to celebrate the fact that at least this year, the 750th anniversary, something is being done here in this parliament and in Perth to recognize this very important anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. You've not let Perth down. I have a little time in hand, so I give members up to five minutes. Uh, Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Alexander Stewart, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I wish firstly to thank Murdo Fraser for securing time in the Chamber for this debate. And indeed, Mr. Fraser has a proud record of submitting motions relating to Scottish history from the 700th anniversary of Bannockburn to the 450th anniversary of the Reformation. However, I doubt we'll ever see a motion from him to commemorate the Battle of the Shirts in 1544, a catastrophic defeat for Clan Fraser. As someone who studied history for five years at secondary school in the 1970s, I consider it shameful that not a single minute of Scottish history was taught, not the unification of Scotland in the four centuries or so to 1266, the Wars of Independence, Union of Crowns and Parliaments, Enlightenment or Industrial Revolution, nothing. It was Peter Lou, poor law reformer, Chartist and tall puddle martyrs. I trust there's been an improvement since. When my son was nine in 2002 and was in primary school play to commemorate the Queen's Jubilee by discussing the salient events of the previous 50 years. Whilst the climbing of Everest, England's wholly contentious World Cup win and ABBA's Eurovision contest victory were included, the reconvening of this parliament in 1999 wasn't. The Treaty of Perth is not widely known, as Murdo Fraser pointed out. However, like him, I hope this debate contributes towards changing that. Nevertheless, it was vital to Scotland and followed the strategically decisive Battle of Largs in 1263 and my own constituency. Even after 750 years, this battle still plays an important part in the town's culture. Now popular for water-based sports, and especially with day trippers, Largs is famous for the battle which continues to be commemorated to this day. While sadly the Viking proud cinema has now vanished, the Battle of Lags Monument, or the Pencil as it is known, built in 1912 through public subscription and a prominent part of the town's charm, remains a popular spot for many visitors. Lags recognise the importance of both the battle and the treaty by holding an annual Lags Viking Festival for a week beginning on the last Saturday in August. 
This focuses on the Battle of Largs, Viking life, and involves not only a reenactment of the battle, but the burning of a longship and a beautiful fireworks display and a party at the pencil. This festival is an excellent opportunity to have fun and enjoy numerous social and cultural events whilst engaging and educating people on the historic events that helped shape Scotland. I warmly invite all members to come along. It brings together a wide variety of people from all across the community and beyond and encourages those of all ages to come together, be more active and take part in events in their town. The Battle of Largs and subsequent Treaty of Perth, along with many rarely remembered events, such as Nicton's Mere in 685 and Athol Stanford in 832, determined forever Scotland's slow march towards nationhood as Gales, Picts, Britons, Angles and Vikings slowly fused into the nation we know now as Scotland. Like Fraser, Gibson is a name of Norse origin. The Treaty of Perth between Scotland and Norway returned the Hebrides and the Isle of Man to Scotland, and in terms of my own constituency, the islands of Arran and Cumbria were at last freed from Norse rule. Perhaps, given Norway's high standard of living today, that could be considered a mixed blessing. The Treaty of Perth came just 29 years after the signing of the Treaty of York, which more or less delineated the border between Scotland and England, and was thus another vital cog in the creation of modern Scotland as we recognise it today. Hopefully this year, many visitors from Norway will join us in Scotland to commemorate the anniversary. And I also look forward to the events and festivities in Perth this coming August, planned to recognise the importance of this treaty. This will play an important part in drawing closer links and an even better relationship between Scotland and Norway. In Largs, links with Norway are strong and there is always Norwegian participation in the Viking Festival. Presiding officer, this anniversary is an opportunity for people to commemorate engage and learn more about the decisions and actions that created the Scotland we know today. I wish all events associated with every success and I hope too that it contributes substantially to help Perth secure the city of culture uh, in 2021. The anniversary must be recognised for the key part it plays in Scotland's history and our heritage uh, and I'm delighted that Murdo Fraser has brought this debate today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. Call Alexander Stewart. This is your first speech, I take it, to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, Deputy Providing Officer. May I start by declaring an interest as a serving councillor on Perth and Kinross Council and direct members to my register of interests. As someone, Deputy Providing Officer, who was born and raised in Perth and comes from a long line of residents of the fair city, I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to participate in the business motion sponsored by Mid-Scotland Fife colleague Murdo Fraser on the Treaty of Perth. 2016, Deputy Presiding Officer, marks the 750th anniversary of the Steel of Treaty, which was signed in Blackfriars Monastery in July 1266. The treaty was the culmination of discussions between Norway and Scotland over a two-year period and saw Norway cede the Hebrides and the Isle of Man, and the Scottish Crowns took that on board, while confirming for the time being that Norwegian uh, sovereignty would be of Orkney and Shetland, and thus ended a conflict uh, between King Alexander III and his Norwegian counterpart, Magnus VI. The people of Perth are proud of their fair city, had the opportunity to be involved in making sure that that momentous event uh, took place. And I'm delighted, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, that Perth and Kinross Council have now taken part and will ensure that a number of events take place uh, during its celebrations. The people of Perth, Deputy Presiding Officer, have the opportunity to go and see an exhibition in Perth Museum and Art Gallery, which starts from the 7th of June and runs to the 28th of August. And a variation of cultural activities are being held in the museum during that period to celebrate and inform of the history of what happened 750 years ago in our fair city. We are delighted to be welcoming the Royal Military Tattoo, and they're going to have a miniature tattoo uh, taking place on the Sunday, the 21st of August. Over 600 individuals will participate in that, and that will be an, an enormous event uh, for the city, uh, and I hope uh, that the weather is kind. And the Consul General will uh, attend that event. But in the spirit of uh, bilateral cooperation, uh, and which was exemplified by the Treaty of Perth, 
the mayors of our twin towns across the world uh, will also have the opportunity to participate uh, during this celebration. They will come from Aschaffensburg, Cognac, Bitkosh, Skoff, Perth, Ontario, and Haiku. And all of these uh, individuals will be there, and that will give an international flavour, a fantastic opportunity for us all to participate uh, in uh, the celebrations. And moreover, at the end of the cup, it will culminate with a, a big dinner, which will be held in the historic St John's Cuck, uh, where individuals will enjoy traditional food and musical entertainment with a Scottish theme. So the Treaty of Perth marks the end of a sustained conflict that was brought about by centuries of battles between various nations. But the whole point of that was set aside for the opportunity for the theme of a reconciliation. And to that end, Perth will also have a great opportunity and privilege to host the highly anticipated weeping window poppy display, which drawed immense crowds uh, when it was first installed in the Tower of London. Uh, and that is coming to Perth, and that will be a great opportunity. The event itself will be at the award-winning Black Watch Museum at Bilhousie Castle. So, presiding officer, the Treaty of Perth has played a very important part in the stories of both Perth and the stories of Scotland. And I'm glad that we will have the opportunity to mark this anniversary in this chamber today. And I hope that many people will take the opportunity to visit the fair city during the celebrations. Perth has a fantastic past. Its present is a bit uncertain, but it has to have a future. And events of this nature will give it the impetus, will give us the opportunity for that to take place. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Liz Smith, who's the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I congratulate Murdo Fraser on securing this debate. He is right to note the historic importance of the Treaty of Perth, especially in marking an end to the long years of conflict between the kings of Norway and the kings of Scots. And to commemorate that treaty is a good way to highlight the historic role of the city of Perth, but it also allows us to celebrate the rich diversity of Scotland's wider history and culture. A treaty agreed at Perth is a reminder that power in the early years of the Scottish Kingdom was dispersed, it was not concentrated. Momentous decisions what is likely to be taken on the banks of the Tay uh, as within sight of the Forth. And the mighty castles of Edinburgh and Stirling are recognised the world over, but it's important, I think, to celebrate other places of equal significance for their role in Scotland's rich history. Donotter on the northeast coast is an ancient and splendid place which looks and feels like the stronghold it once was. Dumbarton Castle on the Clyde celebrated a thousand years of its history uh, as, at the Rock of Ages event only last weekend. And just as the Treaty of Perth reflects how power within the medieval Scottish Kingdom was dispersed, so it also marks the expansion of that kingdom into neighbouring regions that have added to the diversity of the Scotland we know today. Murdo Fraser rightly said that the uh, way in which Scotland stands now is not something that was true then, uh, nor was it preordained. And it's easy to make the mistake of reading history backwards, of assuming that things that happened in the past were bound to produce the outcomes we see now. The end of Norwegian claims south of the Pentland Firth might be seen as a likely outcome, but it wasn't ever a certain outcome. But of course, a claim to rule the Hebrides from the Scottish mainland was ultimately easier to sustain than a, a claim to sustain sovereignty from the other side of the North Sea. But the truth is that those islands had resisted rule and claims from both Norway and mainland, mainland Scotland. And even after the Treaty of Perth, it took the, took the Kings of Scots another 200 years to overcome the political autonomy of the Lordship of the Isles. And indeed, as Kenneth Gibson reminded us, conflict continued thereafter, not least uh, when the Macdonalds routed the Frasers at Blarna in 1544. <laughs> And the Gaelic Lordship in the Hebrides was not the only place to resist royal encroachment on local autonomy in medieval Scotland. Galloway, too, was a Gaelic Lordship with a Norse heritage and able to look across the Irish Sea for allies in opposing Scottish royal power. And the lands bordering the Murray Firth produced their own claimants to the Scottish Crown, most famously Macbeth, and when they lost that dynastic struggle, they, they fought for centuries to maintain local autonomy. And as Murdo Fraser reminded us, Orkney and Shetland 
remained subject to the Norwegian then the Danish crown for several generations after the Treaty of Perth, while the borderlands between Scotland and England were contested over those same generations. So for all these reasons, the early history of Scotland is about a lot more than simply the development of the Scottish state or the growth of the Scottish nation. When we tell Scotland's story to our visitors and to our children, and Kenneth Gibson's right to highlight the importance of doing that in our schools as well as in the informal ways that it has always been done. But it is important that we do not tell that story only from the centre. The Treaty of Perth, for example, it does mark the addition of the Hebrides and for a while the Isle of Man to the Scottish Kingdom. But it's also a chapter in the histories of those, all of those islands, which the Minister, of course, will know, uh, and which are worth telling in their own right. We should celebrate the history of the Scottish Kingdom and commemorate its great events, as will happen, as Mr Stewart uh, so eloquently described, uh, in Perth this summer. But we should also celebrate all those other histories of people and places which had and asserted a different identity in historical times because they too have contributed to the wealth and diversity of the Scotland we know today. Uh, thank you. Liz Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I, can I begin by uh, congratulating my uh, good friend and colleague Alexander Stewart on his uh, maiden speech. Uh, Alexander Stewart, Murdo Fraser and I have come a very long political journey over many years, not quite uh, 750 years, but nonetheless a long political like journey <laughs> in Persia. And it is just so good in light of our much better results in the recent election that Alexander has been elected to this place and I'm sure he will be a great credit to this parliament. Could I also uh, congratulate Murdo Fraser on bringing this uh, issue uh, to the chamber and uh, to say I was a little relieved when he read out the letter that was in the Herald from the Department of Celtic because when I saw it first on his desk I thought it was a communication from Celtic Football Club and that might have been a rather different issue. But I think when it comes to uh, this debate as I was uh, looking uh, through the research on uh, this whole uh, topic. I was very struck by uh, the complex tapestry, tapestry of the orange origins of uh, Scotland. And that's a uh, reference that Lewis MacDonald made uh, too, that the Scotland that was taking shape in the 13th century really existed in a very embryonic form. And that uh, shape has changed uh, so many times uh, in the centuries since. And I think one of the things that we have to recognise uh, in Scotland and be immensely proud of um, is that tapestry that Murdo Fraser has described and the way that we have fashioned our culture, our uh, social network, our economy uh, around all of that. When the uh, treaty, of course, was first signed, the various peoples of Scotland would have spoken very different languages. Gaelic, and I know the minister, I don't know if you're delivering your uh, response in Gaelic uh, this afternoon, but uh, the Old Norse, we would have had a mixture in the two in the Outer Hebrides between Middle English and Scots and Edinburgh and the borders, and possibly in uh, also Cumbric in Dumfries and Galloway and in Clydeside. Now, Cumbric is now extinct, um, and that would uh, have not been something that was dissimilar to the Welsh language. In fact, uh, some of my colleagues uh, on the SNP benches may be interested to know uh, that their hero, William Wallace, born around the same time that the treaty was signed, could actually have been a Cumbric speaker himself. The name Wallace is a corruption of Welsh, and his name would have meant William the Welshman or William the Briton. However, learning all that made me wonder how the average inhabitant of this nascent nation really thought about themselves, whether they identified as Gaels or Vikings, Scots or Britons, or whether they even really knew or cared that they were very much part of the Kingdom of Scotland at all and how that all uh, came together. So it has always been one of the wonders of this country that the people who live in it, and I think um, perhaps Perth itself um, exemplifies this, that it does bring together so many people. And Alexander in his speech referred to the fact that there has been a bit of a sticky patch in Perth and its surrounding communities uh, just of, of recent times. But he's right to say that it is a, a superb city and we need to bring everybody together, I think, to ensure that it is rebuilt and that it can look to the future in a way that can make us proud again and make us able to deliver all the rich resources that are so much uh, part of what we love as being people who represent that, whether that's, uh, as I say, from an economic perspective, uh, whether it's from our rich arts and cultural history in the city, but just from the presence of it being the centre of Scotland and from its historical past, it has got so much to offer 
and hopefully it will have again. So thank you, Murdoch Fraser, for bringing this to the Chamber and I look forward to the Minister's comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I call the Minister, please. Um, seven minutes. Presiding officer, as the Treaty of Perth is, as far as I can tell, a live international treaty, the happy task of responding on behalf of the government in this debate falls to me as Minister for Europe. I refer to my entry in the Register of Interests as a member of the Norwegian Scottish Association. Can I congratulate Mr Fraser for securing a debate that allows me to talk about two of my favourite countries and also specifically the Hebrides, including my constituency, which are, of course, as others have mentioned, the central subject of the treaty itself. Inchigal, one of the Gaelic names for the Western Isles, means the Isles of the Strangers and refers to the fact that the Strangers, in this context a euphemism for Vikings, had exerted political control over the islands until the treaty that we're discussing today. Now, this is probably the point where uh, I sense certain members might get slightly anxious that I'm going to break into Gaelic. However, in deference to our treaty partners and to reassure uh, Ms Smith, I am going to use this event instead as the moment I break cover and identify myself as an enthusiastic, if still very hesitant, learner of Norwegian. So, for 250 years since, came Kong Magnus the sixth Hakan son of Norge and Scotland's king Alexander the Third to the only him between the two lands in the war. Da ended the period of Norsk makt over Hebridene. Likevel er det selvfølgelig fremdeles mange forbindelser mellom Hebridene og Norge den dag i dag. De fleste av stedsnavnene på kystlandsbyene på Hebridene er av norsk opphav. Det mest berømte eksempelet på kunnskap fra vikingtida i Europa er sjakkbrikken fra Løs som ble laget 100 år før Perth-traktaten ble undertegnet og det ble funnet begravet på strandene mer enn 600 år senere. Sammen med traktaten med England som ble inngått i York i 1237 var Perth-traktaten veldig viktig av en annen grunn. De to traktatene la grunnlaget for Skottlands grenser nesten akkurat som vi kjenner dem i dag. Freden som ble inngått i Perth mellom de to landene våre har holdt ut veldig godt og lenge. Likevel håper jeg at Norge har glemt at det står skrevet i traktaten at Skottland skulle betale Norge 100 sølvmark hvert år. Vi sluttet å gjøre dette etter de første 100 årene. Which is to say that when, <coughs> when King Magnus VI of Norway and Alexander III, King of Scots, made their treaty in Perth, they may have ended Norse rule over the Hebrides, but as uh, Mr. MacDonald pointed out, they did not end the many cultural connections between the Hebrides and Norway. These are most obviously exemplified in the island's Norse place names and in the famous Lewis Chessmen. The national importance of the treaty, especially when taken together with the 1237 Treaty of York, uh, is significant. And as Mr. Fraser and others have pointed out, these two treaties essentially do create the borders uh, of Scotland uh, that we know today. Even if it is to be hoped, as others have alluded to, that Norway has forgotten that Scotland has long stopped paying them the 100 marks a year that the treaty does require. But it is perhaps Excuse also... Me, an intervention. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Gibson, that, in, uh, in Norwegian, the, please. The, the, obli the obligation to pay the 100 marks per year was actually cancelled following a marriage agreement with the, king of, the daughter of the King of Denmark uh, some five centuries ago. The member is, of course, right, and I was only joking, but uh, uh, it nonetheless, it nonetheless uh, does point to uh, some of what's in the treaty, uh, and as a member uh, alludes to some of what has changed since then. It's also worth reflecting briefly on the, the human dimension though, of the treaty, and let me uh, mention that the treaty specifically uh, does uh, in, ensure that, uh, quote, in the, the said islands under the dominion of the said lord, the king of Scotland, uh, if they wish to remain, uh, they, the Norwegians, may stay in the land freely and in peace, and if they wish to leave, they may depart with their goods freely and in complete peace. This exemplary foresight did much to guarantee the peaceful coexistence between the two people, and we are, I hope, still seeing 
uh, the deep friendship between Scotland and Norway today uh, as Scotland pursues the cooperation with Nordic countries uh, as part of our Nordic Baltic policy statement. Now, in, in addition to the uh, events mentioned by Mr Stewart, uh, I very much welcome the academic conference taking place in Perth on the 27th and 28th of August, which is being jointly organised by the Scottish Society for Northern Studies and Perth Natural History Society. I'm sure this will be a very rewarding way to recognise how much the fair city of Perth, just as much as Largs, uh, affected forever the fates of Scotland, Norway and indeed the Isle of Man. Uh, and uh, to return to Mr Gibson, I hope it's also uh, very much uh, 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 evidence of our increased willingness uh, as a nation to celebrate and indeed teach uh, our own history. And it is an opportunity too, not just to look back at the Middle Ages, but to think about the ongoing connections which Norway and Scotland have in our own age. I dag er Norge og Skottland mye mer enn forbundsfeller. Et sterkt vennskap mellom de to landene har utviklet seg. Jeg tenker på Norges innsats under andre verdenskrig, da kong Håkan den 20. og de norske styrkene tilbrakte mye tid i Skottland. Med sikte på framtiden tenker jeg også på de ekonomiske og kulturelle forbindelsene mellom Norge og Skottland. Alt dette kan vi takke Perth-traktaten for. Norway and Scotland are much more than allies, presiding officer. They are fun friends, as was witnessed by the frequent presence of King Haakon VII and the Norwegian armed forces in Scotland during the Second World War, and looking to the future by the many ongoing economic and cultural ties that bind us now. I leave it to others to work out when Norwegian, beyond the word ombudsman, was last spoken in this parliament, presiding officer, but hopefully it is not an act as politically charged as it might have been a few centuries ago. I take this chance again of thanking Mr Fraser and all others who have contributed to this very welcome opportunity to celebrate the long, productive, and at least since the Treaty of Perth, very amicable relationship between Scotland and Norway. Tak skal du ha, Minister. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the debate. I now suspend this meeting until 2.30.